Now, most important here is the position of the patient. The surgeon must do the position himself or herself. Never gives his job to the assistant. The three components in this, number one, anti-tendon bulk. Can anybody tell me why? Why do you want the head of the uh, position raised? Come on, quick, quick, quick. What is the purpose of giving an anti-tendon bulk position? Prevent aspiration. Prevent aspiration. I think you're casting aspirations on our poor anesthesiologists. They, they are doing a very good job. Don't be cast as well. Yes, please. Well, the engorgement. The vein. Vein, anger, venous drainage is better. That's the answer. Antitonal bug helps the venous drainage better. You do not get absolutely right. Not aspiration. Aspiration, nothing to do with this position. And number two, number two, before you extend the neck, always previous day when you uh, examine the patient, ask the patient for symptoms of cervical spondylitis. Especially once you cross the age of 40, you've got a patient with a uh, later age group, it's much better to ask a patient, do you have any symptoms suggested to cervical spondylitis? In which case, get a proper opinion before you extend the neck. Don't get trouble. These are days where for the minimum uh, change, people will go for litigation. So kindly ask the patient the question regarding cervical spondylitis. Provide no symptoms, be happy. Now, why do you want to extend the neck? What's the purpose of extending the neck? Why do you want to extend the neck? A basic, we're starting with position. Come on, quick. What, Ravi? Answer. Pandey, handsome young man. Come on, answer the question. Yeah, yeah yes, please. Sir, increases the space in the operative field. That's a, I see at a postgraduate level, the one thing that is necessary is specific answers. The answer should be the whole visceral compartment becomes more anterior. It gets pushed. Understand what I mean? You have the vertebra, the visceral compartment is sitting right in front of the vertebra. So when you extend the neck, you find that the visceral compartment is pushed anteriorly, making exposure to the thyroid better. You understand? Those are words to be used. How do you plan to extend the neck? You keep a sandbag or something under there between the where? Shoulders. And keep a sandbag or a folded towel under the sure, This part will make sure that is in the proper position. There should not be any L to tilt either to this side or that side. So you should be extremely careful about this and make sure that the position of the neck is properly or And then I do not want to show the toweling technique. You, I am sure all of you are familiar with that. So, the, Whole head face, everything is covered nicely, and then of course, anesthetic is usually the uh, classical position for the incision is about where the classical position is described in most books two fingers above the superstitial notch. But sometimes, you kindly, especially when you're a beginner, mark the incision before you extend the neck. Understand? When the neck gets stretched, you may mark incision two centimeters, uh, two fingers above. When you flex the neck to normal position, you may find it's uh, so close to the superstitial notch, and the scar gets adhered in the superstitial notch. Cosmesis is very poor. So, of course, over a period of time, you know how to mark. In fact, many operative surgery textbooks today tell you to make an incision down about the middle of the neck. It's a little too high. And so, as a beginner, Make sure that you make the incision, uh, mark out the incision before you extend the neck so that you don't get in this trouble that the scar is so low that the scar gets adhered into the near the suprasternal area. Understand? Of course, I've got one more picture which is on a lighter vein. I, when I was operating on thyroid, I used to tell them I have a local jeweler who will make a special thyroid necklace for you uh, which will cover the scar, and that's what you see in the next picture of a lady wearing a beautiful and the scar is completely covered. You pray to God that you don't need to order an extra necklace because the patient already spent enough 
money for the thyroid operation, don't want to spend more money for the necklace. But that's in a lighter way. Now, once you uh, incise the skin and platysma, you come to the subcutaneous plate. Uh, in the beginning, all of us rain flaps. Some of us reach a stage where you don't need to raise the flap, but that comes much later. A word of warning here, I wanted to mention this even, I think, yesterday. You find your chiefs with them, hundreds of surgeries. They may adopt a technique, which may look very nice for you. But a beginner, there may be areas of difficulty. This is one such area. Once you get enough experience, you don't need to raise the flaps. When you raise the flap, it's practically avascular, provided your flap is proper. In fact, thyroid has two, thyroidectomy has two distinct advantages for the surgeon. Number one, you must learn to obtain absolute hemostasis before you move further. There's no place for leaving a bleeder and then going further, operating continuously. You should stop any stage as a bleeder. You stop the bleeding. Of course, it's a good principle for all operations. But in thyroid, it's a special place. Number two, thyroid also teaches you the importance of anatomical planes. Unless you carry out the dissection, the anatomical proper planes, your operation is not going to be good. And learn that right from the beginning. So you have incised only the skin and platysma. Underneath, you have a loose area of tissue which separates from the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. That's the plane you get that's practically avascular. You may find one or two bleeding points. If I'm sorry, I should have mentioned earlier. I presume that we are operating under only one energy source. That's a usual unipolar diathermy we have. I'm not talking about bipolar diathermy. I'm not talking about the mod. You will get only a unipolar. So you raise the upper flap until you reach the what's the limit to the upper flap? What's, what's the limit to the upper flap? How far should you go? Usually, once you read the come on. Prominence of the laryngeal cartilage. Fine, good, correct. Thyroid cartilage, absolutely. Lower flap, you expose both the sternoclavicular joints almost. Understand? If you raise a flap, if they, now there's a question. Sometimes you get huge goiters. Now, uh, making a larger incision doesn't help you. There's no need for a hockey stick incision unless you are planning to do extra procedures. Even the larger goiters have come to you a little later. You can manage the same incision. If you raise the flap too much in a male, what's the disadvantage? Suppose you, you're scared that the upper pole may give you prop, uh, trouble and then you want to raise the skin flap beyond the thyroid cartilage. Does the patient have any post-operative minor disadvantage? Minor. The cutaneous nerve may be damaged and the person may find it difficult to shave. So it's better stop at thyroid cartilage. There's no need to go up to the higher to raise the flap because the, uh, obviously cutaneous nerves will get cut and that area becomes uh, sort of numb and the post-operative period patient will find difficult to shave because the area is totally numb. So as far as possible, don't raise the flap beyond. Understand that? It's an avascular plane. And again, I'm repeating, uh, subcutaneous bleeders, any bleeders in, uh, during this section must be absolutely controlled before we proceed further. Next is to identify the midline. Quite often, thyroid causes a displacement of structures, and therefore, you have to again go find out where the suprasternal notch is, where the thyroid cartilage is. Stick to the midline, irrespective of the location of swelling. And your incision through that uh, will carry through the investing layer as well as the gap between the strap muscles. What are the strap muscles you are interested in? Sterno. Sternothyroid. Sternothyroid. Right, those are the two strap muscles. And you have a potential space between the two provided in the midline. Don't start separating because strap muscles is very easy to get a wrong plane. And a part of one sternal thyroid may go to the other side, sternal thyroid may go to the opposite side. So stick to the midline. So you incise the investing layer, you've got a potential gap between the strap muscles. And then, what do you do? Is 
separate the th strap muscles and then and then and then middle thyroid vein yes, middle thyroid vein proceed come to you see my picture i'll come to middle thyroid before that there's one other point you have to inside the so called false capsule and expose the gland with your incision you must cut through investing layer separate the strap muscles they get into the plane between the strap muscles and the so called false capsule again derived from the rectal fascia only understand that this is really when you extend down you call it what we we'll call it a pretracheal fascia is this important to know about the pretracheal fascia what is the anatomical importance of the pretracheal fascia we have heard santosh abram the other day surely would have talked about it why is the pretracheal fascia important from a surgeon's point of view anybody it's condensation sir it's condensation it's uh, uh, posteriorly it is condensed and it is Known as Barry's ligament, it is related to carnal nerve. I don't. At the more more fundamental level, because the thyroid gland is enclosed within the pretracheal fascia, and the pretracheal fascia attached to attached to what? Attached on, to the tracheal cartilage. Tracheal cartilage, sir. My dear, upper cartilage. Upper, upper, upper. Upper cartilage. <laughs> Too much a disturbance. Too much a disturbance. No, no. I'll ask you for basic MBBS question. Why does the thyroid move up with deglutition? Why does the thyroid move up with deglutition? It is indirectly attached to the larynx through this pretracheal. Indi indirectly, sir. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Through. It's also attached to the hyoid bone in the middle. It's a diamond face. Remember, pretracheal fascia is a diamond-shaped fascia. The top is narrow, and where does it extend? The lower down. What's the lower extent of the pretracheal fascia? This is a basic Medial anatomy Medial question. Mediastinum. Where? Ah, uh, mediastinum. Where? Along the trachea vessels. The trachea. Along the trachea, it goes down right up to the tracheal bifurcation, is it? It gets attached to the fibrous tissue at the root of the great vessels. That's why. When a thyroid gets enlarged, it doesn't come in the subcutaneous plane. It goes behind the sternum. In fact, I've seen only one recurrent malignancy of thyroid, which is uh, because the anatomical planes have all been disturbed with previous operation. The patient is swelling in front of the sternum. The reason why a thyroid swelling descends behind the sternum, what's called a retrusion goiter, is because the pretracheal fascia A goes down right up to the superior mediastinum. Understand that? It's a diamond shaped fascia. And what happens when the patient swallows? The hyoid moves up. Why does the hyoid move up? MBBS question. To take the epiglottis upwards to close the to close the airway during swallowing is fundamental. So when you give water and make the patient swallow, you'll find that the hyoid bone has to move up to take the epiglottis upwards to close that's the airway and so that the water doesn't enter the larynx but enters the only the foot pipe. Understand that? A small, a small clinical point here. Days are gone when you used to ask the patient swallow. Today is considered a little ungentlemanly. So you keep a glass of water by the side. If you want to test, give the patient a small amount of water, ask the patient to swallow the water and see the movement up. Don't go on repeating this test several times. That's what happens in the exam. So do the test properly. So now what we have done, we have just incised. Understand now is if you're in the proper plane, you can do the gentle dissection, the fingers, you can mobilize the entire investing layer, the muscle, as well as the pretracheal fascia are functionally one unit at this stage and detract it laterally. Now there's a point over the middle thyroid when somebody raised. I purposely put this picture. We were told when we were postgraduate, the myth of this middle thyroid vein being as shown in this picture, a very short trunk. And they said, if you apply a little traction, the middle thyroid vein will get completely damaged. You produce a lateral hole in the, in the what do you see on the sides? Interjugular vein. My dear friends, I can assure you this is very, very uncommon. In my practice, I found that more often than not, the middle thyroid is totally absent. When present, look at the next picture. 
is long enough for you to identify comfortably like it. Unnecessarily, a Miltarada vein has been uh, blamed as a villain. It is not such a bad villain at all. Understand that? There is absolutely nothing to worry. Miltarada vein is a myth. I think we should be, we should be taken out of books. Operative surgery book should, be, should not mention. Yes, please. Somebody is it out? Dialysis shall wake up. Slow, uh, can you slow down your uh, uh, volume? Can, still, can you slow down volume still less? Still, volume is too much. And what I'm trying to tell you is that the middle thyroid vein is not as lethal as is made out in operative surgery books, as is made out by during many talks. I have done hundreds of thyroid. In many patients, the middle thyroid vein is absent. Those who have a middle thyroid vein. The second picture is a more accurate description of the middle thyroid vein. The trunk is long enough for you to identify the vein on the surface of thyroid. Ligate, you don't, you don't, you don't see the interjugular vein at all at this stage. You are on the thyroid surface. You can identify this vein, ligate it nicely and divide it. Understand? This is unfortunately given too much of importance. Right. I have now stick to the same slide. My method is, of course, you already tried. Now, the next question is, should you divide the strap muscles? In my experience, only when you're very junior, when you've got a very large thyroid, you may think of dividing. More often than not, proper retraction gives you enough exposure. You have a good assistant who will retract the structure beautifully well, exposure is adequate. Okay, suppose you decide to divide the strap muscles, where do you divide? At the level of the incision, above the incision, below the incision? Above the incision. Above the incision. Above the incision. Below. Above the incision. Below the incision. Above, you know, above. You know, above the incision. Okay. Above I'm very happy. Incision. Very good. Excellent. Because even I take clinics with the physical presence, I take a word. Because today is a democratic country. I take a word. Unfortunately, I can't take a word. But I'm very happy that most of you are cut on the wrong side. You forget about this uh, poor, unfortunate now which takes a loop. What's the name of the now? What's the name and of the cervical. now? Answer cervical. Answer cervical. You know, you, and you know the, it takes a big loop. Cut it as low as possible. Never cut it at the level of the incision. Certainly not above the incision. If you cut that, the portion of strap muscle which is below the cut loses is no supply. It doesn't have major consequences, but these are questions which you put your work. What happens MS exam practicals? When you're unable to answer one question, your level of confidence starts coming down. You get, in simple English, you are rattled. I don't want that to happen at this stage because there are much more questions that are going to come later. You get in trouble at the strap muscle stage, obviously your performance tends to come lower, lower and lower. Understand? So unless examiner asks, you just say, I I re retract the muscle to get NFX, which is absolutely sufficient in most cases. I hardly cut the strap muscles. I think in the uh, maybe first few years, I might have cut. My chief never used to cut. So therefore, I followed that habit, and it has given me absolutely good results. If you're operating on recurrent thyroid, if problem. Uh, that's a different story. Today, you don't have a problem with recurrent thyroid because you take out the whole thyroid in one sitting only. Right. Now, I for, always start my dissection at the lower portion of thyroid where you can see the inferior thyroid vein. You feel the trick here. Yeah? Understand that? Except in one circumstance when you have a huge nodule occupying the isthmus itself where this is not practical. Rest of the cases where you have, uh, you are planning a total thyroid I mean, you start your dissection. I start my dissection. I visualize the trachea, the front of the trachea. There always is some fat. Your gentle dissection is a little cotton uh, swab. You expose the veins and ligate those veins, I repeat again, which are in front of the trachea. Don't go anywhere beyond. You must make sure that the veins you are ligating now are in front. Don't go to the sides. Can you tell me the reason why? Once you go beyond, you don't know where the recurrent nerve is. So therefore, at this stage of the game, you will only like it those veins which are in front of the trachea, 
draining from the thyroid gland. Where do they drain? This inferior thyroid vein, where do they drain? Ultimately, where do they drain? Brachiocephalic. Brachiocephalic. Yes, that's right. Brachiocephalic vein or olden days we used to call innominate vein. Right. Because what I'm trying to tell you goes down to the mediastinum. So keep yourself close to the thyroid gland. Don't go down. Keep yourself as close to the thyroid gland and ligate those veins, I repeat again, which are in front of the trachea. That means you have now cleared a major portion of the lower half of the thyroid. Not only the isthmus, also a bit of the lateral lobe now becomes clear. Understand that? Now, my step, next step I go is the superior pole. This is not the ordinary. Many people start surgery at the superior pole, but I start my dissection at once I demonstrate lower border, I go to the superior pole. You can see as a superior thyroid artery, main artery, and then the What's the now there next to it? Which is the now? What do you call it? External branch of the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Right, derived from which now? Branch of vagus. Vagus, vagus. Right. right. Now, uh, unfortunately for you, the vein and the uh, uh, the nerve and the artery are not so away from each other. Understand that. Now, many people get into problem with the superior port. There's a very simple solution, of course, learned by trial and error. You'll find that the anterior branch, I'll go to the next picture, then come back to this picture again. The anterior branch of the uh, superior third vein runs in front of the, uh, starts from the upper port and runs in front of the thyroid gland. You can easily identify this artery. Understand that? If you ligate this branch and divide it, you've got to see to believe it how much a space occurs because it retracts. You ligate and divide between probably a few millimeters between two ligatures. Once you divide, you get a depth of a centimeter or even more. This step releases the upper pole and makes identification of the superior thyroid artery at the upper pole much more simpler. This is one step I have found extremely useful in all thyroid operations. I repeat again, identify the anterior branch which runs on the surface of the thyroid gland. You don't have to go near the pole at all. On the surface, you pick up this artery, ligate it, divide it, the two cut ends move away from each other and uh, I come to the conclusion, the superior pole is the one that tethers, the artery is, uh, the, gets tethered to the gland. Uh, once you divide the anterior branch, this tethering disappears. Dissection of the superior pole becomes much, much easier. Now you ask the, uh, you are ascend to retract the upper pole beautifully well, and you can see the trunk of the main artery entering the gland. And the principle is to ligate it, ligate it, as close to the gland as possible. Only again, repeat again, uh, you don't have to search for and identify the external branch. Please remember that. If you stick to this technique, the nerve is far away and you will not damage the nerve. People get in trouble because it is dissected as a whole and is still tethered to the gland beautifully and therefore dissection becomes more difficult. Once you divide the anterior branch, the superior pole gets totally released, the tension is gone, and you can easily identify the superior pole and you ligate the artery and divide it. Understand that? Once you do that, I come down along the upper border, um, the inner border of the upper lobe, and you'll find this artery joins with the corresponding artery from the opposite side. This picture doesn't show that because I didn't imagine the same curve on the opposite side you may have to ligate that branch which comes from the opposite side. Means I am now exposing the upper border of the lateral lobe, upper border of the isthmus, and I don't go to the opposite side now. I am operating. Please remember when you operate on the uh, right lobe, you are standing on the left side. When you operate on the left, side, left lobe, you have to come back to the right side. So let us say I am now standing on the left side. I am doing right lobe dissection now. Understand that? We ligate the uh, the artery at the isthmus, and now I have uh, completely free the upper border thyroid lobe. You may find a vein along with the artery, so more often than it's ligated together, 
But if they separate vein, you've got to ligate it and divide it. Now you gently lift the upper pole. There's one other point. Let me go back to the previous picture. Sorry. There's one other point. This is almost always never a single superthyroid vein. There is a vena, vena comitantis, which accompanies the artery. You'll always find one more branch posteriorly. So the moment you like it, the superior artery, 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 don't think the dissection of the upper pole is complete. If you try to gently lift the upper pole, you'll invariably find a vein uh, running from the posterior aspect of the upper pole to join the interjugular vein. It needs a simple dissection. This vein is invariably seen once you divide the artery, you find a vein behind the artery, which is not closely intimately related to the artery and identify this vein and ligate. Now the upper pole is free. Once you free the upper pole, you gently start lifting the uh, posterior border, the la la upper uh, lateral lobe from above onwards. You may find one or two small vessels which need to be clipped and divided. Be careful. And at this stage, superior, uh, the upper, superior parathyroid is easily visible. Now, how do you identify the various ligament? How do you identify them? Now, what you're doing is lifting the lateral. I, I'm sorry, before that, I should have mentioned one step. Many people, when they do a total thyroidectomy, tend to divide the isthmus right at the beginning. Because now, see, please remember, I have now freed both the upper and the lower body of the isthmus. The isthmus is now only attached to the trachea. It is, other attachments have been completely divided. So the temptation to divide the isthmus at this stage must be totally given up. Understand that? So you have the isthmus, you have the lateral lobe, you gently lift the lateral lobe and you start lifting it by blunt dissection, you can lift it up from the trachea. You may find one or two vessels which may be ligated, but at this stage you will invariably find the various ligament. How do you identify the various ligament? This is where the touch is important. The resistance provided by the Berry's ligament is much more. The rest of the thyroid uh, lobe gets lifted off from the trachea with minimum resistance. That feeling, once you get it, next time when you operate, you'll manually feel it very uh, Berry's ligament is better felt than seen. Understand what I'm trying to tell you? The resistance applied, it may need a little sharp dissection. Be careful, as somebody has mentioned already, recurrent religion now is very close to this structure. Once you divide that, more often than not, you see the recurrent religion now. Understand that? So once you divide, now the probably the upper half of the thyroid uh, lobe is now getting detached from the deeper structures. Now we come to the inferior thyroid artery. This we have finished already. I think I'll go back to in here. This inferior artery. Now there is a time when uh, it was taught that the inferior artery should be ligated as far away from the thyroid gland. Can anybody tell me the reason? This is completely given up now. Nobody does it. But there is a time when uh, I was taught that you should ligate the artery as far away. As it exists from behind the carotid sheath, you ligate it one mile away from the thyroid gland. What was the basis for this and why is it given up? Two questions. The recurrent ligation is associated with the. Yes, right, branches. you're right. And the but why is it. The thyroid is to many branches before entering the thyroid substance. So we should ligate individual branches rather than the branch. You're right, but you're not answered completely. And you're right. It's a parathyroid gland. Exactly. The main answer is two things. Yes, I agree. Now I'll explain it again. The idea was that there is a, a surgical philosophy which is absolutely wrong, given up completely. What the surgeons, uh, our teachers, I'm sorry to say, said that structures you don't see are not likely to be damaged. That is the worst statement a surgeon can make anywhere in the body. Understand that there's no guarantee that structures which are not seen that cannot be damaged. 
the, the example is common bile duct. Olden days when you're doing open cholecystectomy, they said, if you don't see the common bile duct, don't worry, you're not likely to damage it. And many people are damaged the common bile duct. And especially once the concept of Mirisi syndrome came, they realized that it was a gross mistake not to identify. Anyhow, that's totally apart. So one must visualize any structure to avoid damaging it. Now you are perfectly right. The days where it was ligated far away is given up forever because the infrathyroid artery uh, into um, the parathyroid gland will lose the blood supply. So we ligate it as close to close thyroid. to them. Exactly. And as somebody rightly pointed out, it's usually one or two branches. Of course, days when we were doing subtotal or hemi, we had to ligate it. We did not divide. It was ligated in continuity. Yes. Uh, can you tell me an example of a ligation continuity anywhere in the body today? Splenic vessel. Splenic artery. You ligate it in continuity and then do what? Allow the spleen to become infected. Right? Huh? Come on. It's a splenic artery. I ligate the splenic artery and leave the spleen behind. I have a splenic infarct, no? I have a splenic infarct. I don't want to have a splenic infarct. There's one place which is not common. I'm sorry. This is not common. I'm an old-fashioned surgeon. This is not common. But it's described in operative surgery books and it may, it's an important point for the exam to catch hold of in the exam. For the examiners. <laughs> if you're doing... Get, mage, get uh, external iliac... Ex, sorry, external carotid artery. Right. Very good. In what operation? In a bleeding from what the oral operation? malignancy. Uncontrolled bleeding. Very good. Now, where do you like it? Now, you have, you know how to uh, like it. Artery. Where do you like just it? Up. Just why? above the first branch, superior third artery. Why, why? Why not ligate it where it gets off from the bifurcation? I I see the bifurcation. I like it. How do you identify? First, I'm sorry. First question, how do you identify what you like it in extracurated and not intercarotid and cause a brain infarct? How do you branch. know that? Branches. 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 Agree. Branches. Right. So now the next question is why ligate it? Uh, distal to the origin of the external carotid uh, external superthyroid artery. Why legate it beyond the superthyroid origin? Answer. Thyroid is the main supply of the thyroid, 80%. Bapre. Do you mean to say thyroid device will ligate like the superthyroid artery, the thyroid undergoes infarction, is it? Have, you like it, all the main vessels still there are vessels coming up from the esophagus to here to keep the thyroid alive. Nature is very, very careful. You know, surgeons do a lot of nonsense. And nature corrects a lot of nonsense done by surgeons. Answer is if you like it, there you have a thrombus forming almost at the bifurcation. And that thrombus can easily block the intercarotid artery. Once you like it, it disturbs the superior thyroid. The blood flows to the superior thyroid and therefore the chance of a thrombus extending down to the bifurcation and blocking the intercarotid artery is drastically reduced. Understand? That's the reason why we like it the extracarotid after the superior thyroid branch has been given up. So, the, so therefore now the concept is please ligate the inferior thyroid artery as close to the thyroid gland as possible. As somebody rightly pointed out, it may be two or even three branches and ligate. And more often than not, if you're careful and your dissection, as I said earlier, this is where the absolute hemostasis become important because our parathyroid glands are recognized by their, by their color, 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 color. 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 Yes, because if you have allowed some bleeding to occur, everything gets uh, blood stained. You don't know where the parathyroid. I don't know. Uh, I give an analogy which usually rather too old for you. How many of you have heard of a gentleman called Richard Gordon? Richard. Gordon amputation. Bah, I'm talking about novelist, madam. You're talking about Gordon Taylor. <laughs> You're talking about <laughs> Sir, Sir Gordon Taylor who did the... Uh, yeah. I'm talking about a novelist. The anesthetist turned novelist who written a lot of novels about doctors. Doctor in the house, doctor in love, doctor, doctor C. And yeah, I believe that uh, we surgeons should read a lot because your human interaction become much better. That's a different subject altogether. Richard, I'm sorry. By the way, Richard Gordon calls the medical students like you the most evolved on this planet. Can you tell me the reason why? He says you're the most evolved of all the humans, uh, all the species that are uh, born in this world. Answer is very simple. 
you may read the age of 28, 29, 30, still there is an humble life record attached to home. As evolution proceeds, you find that the younger one depend upon the parent more and more. And that makes medical students most evolved because half the lifetime you have to be depending upon the parent. Right now? Yeah. All right, very good. So you are the most evolved species on this world. Be happy. Okay, coming back to this. So because you are identifying the parathyroid gland by the color, maintain absolute hemostasis. I was, I'm sorry, I must tell you about it. A doctor in the house is a medical student and of course he spent much more time in extracurricular activities and falls in love with the nurse and one fine morning he gives her red carnation. She is so happy. When she goes to the nurse's hostel, she finds that the most ugly and the most old, everybody is carrying red carnation. And then she realizes that her red carnation has no value. So if you allow some bleeding to occur, you'll be like the doctor and looking, everything looks red. You don't know where the yellow parathyroids are. Be careful. You must have absolute hemostasis at every stage. Once you identify, you can, once you divide the various ligament and your ligate into the third artery, you will now come down to the lower pole. It's very easy because the loose area tissue which binds the trachea to the gland can easily be separated gentle dissection. At the lower pole, again, a little point which sometimes is forgotten. Unfortunately, I tried to get that picture. I could not get that picture. More often than not, there's a vein extending from the lower pole which joins the interjugular vein just above your sternoclavicular joint. This is called by the very famous name in thyroid surgery. Come on. Which is the most famous name in thyroid surgery? Theodore Cocker. Yeah, absolutely right. Theodore Cocker. And this is the Cocker's vein. The Cocker's vein. At least I had one associate who was very fond of injuring this and I had to repair the interjugular vein, not one, more than one. So be careful. Why I'm saying this is, once you see the recurrent laryngeal now, there's a degree of complacency. Please remember, complacency is the worst enemy of a surgeon. I'm sorry. I was going through uh, one of the Facebook recently, and a gentleman, uh, luckily he's not a surgeon, but some other branch, he has written that the operation has come down to the spinous autonomous level. I think it's a very dangerous treatment. No operation come down to a spinal reflex stage. I quote a quotation which I'm very fond of, which appeared first in way back in 1988 in one of the surgical of North America. There's nothing called minor surgery. There are only minor, minor surgeons. Some of us mature to become major surgeons. Some of us remain minor surgeons throughout our life. I can tell you the complication arising from the, from the some of the simplest procedures. The gentleman is doing a supraclavicular node biopsy and injected local directly into the subclavian vein. And he was doing it in his office before he could do anything, the patient died. There have been many more examples. The worst example I can quote is, it happened to a surgery postgraduate in a medical college teaching hospital. Another postgraduate was asked to tap the left chest for pleural effusion and he entered the spleen. And the patient, had, the student had to undergo a splenectomy instead of a pleural aspiration. So there's nothing called minor surgery. So whatever stage of thyroid, do not become complacent. So please look for the vein of cocker as you come to the lower pole, ligate it. At this stage, you can lift up the whole, uh, that but right lateral look of the trachea and the thyroid cartilage. Understand that? Gentle dissection. Now, if you divide the isthmus, and what happens? When people start dissecting, divide the isthmus, they start dissecting from anterior to posterior. You find a lot of abnormal stress on the posterior border. Chances of vessels getting torn off become much higher. So my method is to start from posterior, identify the posterior border thyroid gland, and gently lift it up from the trachea as well as the thyroid cartilage. You find you have come to the midline up to the isthmus. Okay, so what you are ligated is the superthyroid artery, first anterior branch, then you have ligated the main trunk of superthyroid artery, then you have ligated a vein that lies posterior to the artery, and then you come down, you have ligated in, uh, infrathyroid artery, its branches as the enter thyroid gland, almost on the capsule, I would say. Come down at the lower pole, look for the vena cocker. Don't search for the inferior thyroid. Superior thyroid is easily visible. 
If you see the inf uh, infrared, well and good. If you don't see the infrared, don't waste time. Because as long as technique is what I've described so far, chance of damage in the infrared are low. I'll come to the, this parathyroids again at a later stage. Now you go to the opposite side and repeat the same procedure. You start at the anterior branch, ligate it, main trunk, come down, uh, deliver the isthmus. At this stage, you'll also find one more structure. I'll come to that later. Once both the lateral lobes are completely lifted off, now the whole gland is hanging only by the isthmus. At this stage, they lift it up, and you will find tiny blood vessels which uh, it attack, I mean, run from the trachea to the isthmus. Be careful. I myself have made a hole in the uh, trachea when I was burning one of the small vessels. Be careful when you're using diatomy. Oh, I'm sorry, posterior border, don't bring diatomy one mile near your section. Because unipolar diatomy has got a habit of what happens? What's the effect known as unipolar diatomy? Keyword lateral thermal damage. What is the key word? Lateral thermal damage. The, the word is scattering. The energy gets scattered. Unlike a bipolar, where energy is focused on a point, unipolar tends scattering. Therefore, structures beyond what you are trying to burn may get collateral damage. Understand that? So, posterior border, don't use. When you're using that, be careful. In I, I myself, I made a hole, and my NSC cousin said, I can see their. Uh, tube through an incision. I mean, luckily, a small hole, nothing. I didn't enlarge it, convert it from a different structure. Okay. Now, you lift the isthmus off and then take out the whole gland. Having done that, what's the next step? What's the next step? Of course, look for hemostasis. Your, your procedure has gone on very well. It's practically dry. Now, if you take off the uh, uh, sandbag or the people between the shoulders and bring the neck back to original position and then look for bleeders again. The small step but very important because the vein may get stretched and vein may not bleed. When that stretching is off, you will find that the vein starts bleeding and then you can you will be able to identify and like it. This that is not a common finding, but it can occur at some time. And by once you are satisfied that the whole field is still up. Now there's one other point. And this is to show the parathyroid, but things are not that easy on the operation table as it's shown in this picture. Now, more often than not, in your enthusiasm to take out the gland, you forget about pyramidalis. It has been my experience to see patients coming back to me despite getting thyroxine. You'll find that the patient comes back with a pyramidal lobe enlargement that produces a very unsightly bulge. Now, the anatomy books still mention that the pyramidal lobe is present to the left of the midline. My experience has been more either on the right side or as shown in this picture, right in the middle. So as you're dissecting the uh, two uh, medial borders of the upper lobe and the upper uh, border of the stimulus, if you find the pyramidal lobe, it may be absent. It may be a muscle only, then you get nothing to worry. You see a pyramidal look, gently lift it off from the thyroid cartilage. You find at the tip there is a tiny little blood vessel. Maybe you can burn your diatomy and lift the pyramidal look, and the whole specimen should look like this. In fact, when I started doing this operation in my own hospital, the pathologists were the most happy people. You know why? Till then, they used to get specimens which are two lobes separate because people used to divide the isthmus routinely and then take out each lobe independently. They used to put two couple of stitches and then for the mounting specimen, they would have mounted those specimens as one tire, but in fact, it's been two tire lobes joined together. Once they started doing, they were the happy people. They said, now we are getting the whole tire in one single specimen without the need for all those things. So this is how a total tire reference specimen should look like. Right. We have time to discuss at least one or two complications. What's the immediate dangerous life threatening complication? Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage. Right. hemorrhage. What do you call this hemorrhage? You have, you have primary reactionary. 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 Right. Why, why, why does it occur? What are the possible causes? Slippage of ligature. Slippage of ligature. Slippage of ligature. Huh? 
Sleeping at the ligature occurs at a very junior level. Once you get enough experience, I think ligature is old. Okay, agreed. Minor branches. Minor branches. If your technique is good, you'll find the most minor branch comfortably. I don't use a magnification. There are people who use uh, optical magnification for that. So. Displacement of clot. Right, agreed. That's a good answer. One more. Blood pressure increase. Ah, that's right. There may be a transient hypotension you're operating, and if the anesthesiologist is not very careful, if the blood pressure has not been. And why is it so dangerous? Right. Compression of the trachea. Very good. Right. How do you recognize it? Patient will have, uh, patient will be anxious, breathing difficulty, strider. Right. It's safer not to wait until strider. I tell you. That's right. You'll find that the patient will start complaining of difficulty. I'll tell you my own experience. I was making rounds in the neighboring ward. The next ward was my post op ward. Previous day, my operation day. And like a, I heard this, some sort of a difficulty in breathing, almost bordering strider. I said, uh, oh, and thyroidectomy must have been done. And then my uh, patient's probably having a bleed. When I walked into the post-op reward, I found it was our own patient, our own unit patient. Okay, what do you do? Okay, Sunday evening, you're the PG in charge. Your boss, because of COVID, now he can't come to the hospital. You're the only person available. What will you do? Patient's having strider. Open the sutures. Open the sutures bedside. My dear girl, what are sutures you're going to open? Huh? Sir, up to the strap muscles. Open That's the strap muscles. muscles. That's right. You've got to divide not only the skin sutures, the subcutaneous sutures, or subcutaneous sutures. In addition to that, you've got to divide those intercutaneous sutures. You have to and then what? You'll find a bleed blood clot. Now, what do you do? Evacuate the hematoma. My dear boy, the point I am trying to tell you, this must be done in the ward. Understand that? Don't wait to shift the patient to OT. OT Evacuate the hematoma? Uh, now, yes, evacuate the hematoma. Now what happens? Surprisingly, sometimes you don't find a fresh bleed. Suppose there's a bleed, what do you do? We secure the airway. Sad. How? But in fact, it, you have you know you're probably lucky enough not to see. The moment you evacuate the hematoma, the patient breathing becomes much easier. It's a magic almost. The strider disappears. Patient very comfortable. Is there any other element that makes the strider worse other than the hematoma? Hypocalcemia. Pardon? Hypo oh, that come much later. No, no. Tracheomalacia. 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 Okay. We will come to tracheomalacia a little later. Bilateral you, injury. Oh, well, all those come much. Now, the point I'm interested in, immediately one additional factor is because you're ligated all the vein, there's a chance of a laryngeal edema. Understand that? Now, you have seen the patient is stable, BP is normal. You have find an active bleeder. You are in the ward, mind you. You are in the ward. You are the only person in the ward. What do you do now? Point I'm driving at. Don't try to catch. Don't try to catch the bleeder in the ward because you compression. Need, yeah, don't you know all that is needed is take a gauze pad and compress. Gentle, stress on the word gentle. Gentle compression variably stops and keep this. Back on, on if possible. Now you take the patient to OT and then you let the anesthesia pass endotracheal tube, give the anesthesia, and then open the wound under proper vision in the OT. You'll find a bleeding point. More often than not, you are surprised there is no bleeding point. Your compression helps to stop the bleeder. In which case, you can put a drain and come out. I didn't talk about closure, whether to keep a drain is personal. Many people today with absolute hemostasis, they don't keep a drain. But if you are a junior and you're worried about the bleed, it's safer to keep the drain. Now we come to recurrent laryngeal now. What happens if one recurrent laryngeal lump is damaged? Let us say one recurrent laryngeal lump. Difficult in breathing. Really? Aspiration and hoarseness. Aspiration. Weakness of voice. Weakness. No, no. What muscle is supplied by the external branches of superior angel? No. If, you know the if the cricothyroid is one side, what happens to the patient? 
change in pitch of the voice ha huh? pitch change loss of timber of the voice timber beautiful word i am a, i am very fond of music i know what a timber is but many people in this audience if they don't have musical taste may not know what a timber what happens in absolute terms is the higher pitches are difficult to sing you go beyond a certain straight higher pitch number 1 number 2 if you are a teacher like me you go on talking for 45 minutes one hour the voice tends to become hoarse that's all right. it doesn't appear immediate for all practical purpose the voice is normal but in prolonged talking as in a teacher's case you may find the hoarse okay now one of the very unfortunate circumstances were bilateral cranial damage what happened what is the position of the vocal median Param- central paramedian paramedian so both that's a beautiful word to describe this position cadaveric cadaveric spasm that's right correct there is no spasm now muscles are gone it's a cadaveric position which is not adequate for proper oxygenation immediately do a tracheostomy am i right do a tracheostomy later on think of the various methods of now today teflon injection atomectomy there are so many procedures described for bilateral recurrent lung injury many of our patients end up with a permanent tracheostomy understand now somebody brought in tracheomalacia now, what is tracheomalacia prolonged compression over the trachea causes collapse of the trachea once the pressure is removed uh, couple of points i would like to emphasize about tracheomalacia number 1 in males by the time you reach the age of 20 or 21 the tracheal rings are almost almost complete the sentence almost in males once you reach the age of 20 21 the tracheal rings are quick almost on the verge of ossification in women the tracheal cartilage is a comparatively softer and all tracheomalacia occurs only in women i am seen i have done hundreds of tracheotomies i never seen a tracheomalacia in a man all my patients undergone tracheomalacia have been women how to recognize it how to recognize on the table it may appear abnormally soft but many of the soft tracheas you get away you don't every soft trachea doesn't mean the patient going for tracheomalacia number 1 is a long standing goiter number 2 the goiter is sufficiently large these are pre conditioned wherein in a woman a tracheomalacia can develop right how to recognize it we are operatively oh, just test the soft tissue neck the moment the I'm sorry too much a disturbance Uh, the moment the endotracheal tube is removed, the patient becomes dyspneic in the OT. That's why this is one of those operations where, after extub, of course, a good principle in general to be there inside the OT. Because what happens in major teaching hospitals is once the third is out, the chief walks away. It is the PGs who will, uh, close and do everything. It's a good habit, at least in private. Make sure that you be with the patient. After extubation, because more than once I have seen this happen. Within a couple of minutes, patient starts getting cyanosed. And the those second, what do you do? What do you do? Keep patient intubated for two hours. Twenty-four hours. After twenty-four hours, what happens? After twenty-four hours, we have to keep the intubation. Why? After twenty-four hours, what happens? Because okay, suddenly gets strengthened, is it? So there is some amount of uh, inflammation which holds the trachea. Tracheal hitch. What I said earlier, madam, it's edema and not inflammation. There is no. Yes, sir. It's edema. So I would say wait for forty. Maybe I'm a little more conservative. Today, see the problem we had in the earlier stages where the endotracheal tubes could not be kept for longer time, and we had to remove it. Today's endotracheal tubes can be kept as long as comfortably. Come on. Not in this. I'm saying some other situation. What's the longest period you can keep a patient one, there? One week, forty one days. Week. One, one. Uh, anything beyond eight to ten days is difficult. Okay. Understand that? Convert them into tracheostomy. Here, uh, another point. Uh, many of you will end up with your own private hospitals. Unfortunately, the audiologists, uh, of course, student nurses are doing a beautiful job, but more often than not. your nursing staff may not be as qualified as you expect as dedicated as you expect and i have found that a tracheostomy management by a nurse is much much easier than management of endotracheal tube 
Only problem is once you do the tracheostomy, the cosmetic element disappears. The scar is bound to be much worse compared to the original scar. But look at your own nursing standards. If you've got good nurses, ICU, well-trained nurses, they can recognize because the unfortunately endotracheal tube gets blocked by what? The secretions which get thickened and they tend to block the lumen. Understand that? Whereas today the tracheostomy management is much successful. It's just know how to suck out the secretions properly and keep it patent. But the same thing cannot be said unless you've got good quality nurses in the ICU or the post-operative ward. There's a word of practical wisdom. Maybe all of you people will get into corporate hospitals where you've got excellent nurses who know more than you and try to influence you as far as the manager. How many of you have heard of a book called Why Surgical Handicraft? Why Surgical Handicraft? Heard about the book? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. It is a Bible for uh, interns. And there's a statement. It's not available that. this time, sir. Not available, right? Eh? No, no, know. it's available. Okay. Available. Okay. available. Ask the lady who says available. No, and no edition has come, sir. Yes. <laughs> in fact, I don't know. I have an old edition. There's a statement in that, which is a Bible for all the interns. The, no, no, only one sir, person. Yeah. Right. We all, I'm happy that you are familiar with the book. Sir, one. we got uh, fast, fast. two more minutes, right. sir. Hey, I'm finishing. I'm coming. I'm coming to yes, the end. Yes, sir, sir. Associate Surgeons of India. Okay. Yeah, fine, fine, right. Uh, uh, the, uh, class. No, no. Only one. Uh, I'm sorry, we are not discussing Paisa Jikantika. I want to mention one line. A junior doctor should not hesitate to take the help of a senior nurse. They are very much experienced and take their help. That's all I want to say. I have no time to discuss parathyroid. But you learn about uh, there is a temporary transient hypo, hypo parathyroid is a very, very common following thyroid. Don't get worried. Don't get worried. Most of them return back to normal. I understand. Of course, somebody has pointed out a large series in this own car, this country. I, I beg to differ. I had, uh, in my entire my life, I had one patient with permanent hypoparathyroid. Otherwise, so many had transient, but it is it was completely okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Strap, strap muscles should be cut from below. Yeah, I always say cut just not not very close to don't divide it close to sternoclave, you can't repair it. Maybe an inch above the sternoclavicular joint, you cut the strap muscle so that the anxious cervical takes a loop, is retained, and that portion of muscle has its uh, nerve supply intact. If you know the anatomy, go and look at the picture of ansa cervicalis, that will explain everything for you. Where thank to you, divide sir. this? Thank you. But thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.